say on the phone? It's coming through the computer. Her? Yeah, so you can hang on. Okay, let me just comb my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we weren't sure if it was on video or not. Oh, no worries. No worries at all. Are you guys Are you guys down in Newport? Leah's well, in Newport. I'm in L.A. And my, I'm working from home. Oh, nice. Good stuff. Good stuff. How about you? I'm up in uh, the Hollywood Hills right now. So. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I met Lee when he was up in Minneapolis uh, for the at a Super Bowl party. A couple oh, years ago. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, not sure if not sure if you remember me, Lee. I was with uh, with Larry. The, the connector. Yeah, the connector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to pop on here. Um, generally, they're about an hour. Is that is that okay time wise? Uh, of course, we can we, we can cut it to whenever you need, but. Uh, yeah, okay. Sweet. Well, um, without further ado, I want to get right into it. So, when is your what was your first memory in sports? Your first memory. And this could be anything where you were playing sports or when you first got involved in sports. It was probably watching the 1955 World Series on a little Kaufman television set. Uh, my dad originally came from New York and was a big Brooklyn Dodger fan and that was finally the year that the Dodgers beat the Yankees and so there was tumultuous excitement in our home and I fell in love with uh, baseball then uh, but in terms of playing sports I, I played them all as as a kid uh, we would play Baseball, basketball, football on the front yard, and and so, and my dad took me to a Ram game. Uh, we were in the one dollar seats back in the fifties. Uh, you needed a massive telescope to uh, be able to identify any of the players <laughs> far away. But uh, I fell in love uh, there, and then my father had played basketball at UCLA, and he. Uh, was a huge Bruin basketball fan, and so I got called to the games uh, back when they played not in Public Pavilion, but in Venice High Gym or at Santa Monica College wow. or all sorts of different places, and then eventually the sports arena, which doesn't exist anymore. Dang. So, it's, so your dad was a very influential role in the early years of your you know, sports interest. It seems like. Keyboard, but I remember one other thing. We had PCL baseball early on. What's and that? My grandfather took me to, it was uh, AAA baseball. Okay. And uh, Los Angeles had the Los Angeles um, Angels and the Hollywood Stars. And I remember my grandpa, who ran a country club, took me to my first baseball game. And uh, it was the PCL. But he was very close with the comedian George Burns. So George Burns and my grandpa and I went out to a game. And I always remember the smell of cigars, which I connote to this day with being at a baseball game. Wow, that is crazy that you that you attach the sensory thing to the, to the first memories of right. your sport. That's pretty crazy. So obviously you were very involved in sports when you were younger. When did you first get into the management side of things? Or when did you first, when were you first even exposed to the management side of, of sports? Well, really, there was no role clearly defined as sports agency when I was growing up. Oh, wow. So nothing I aspired to. I went to UCLA for a year and then to Cal Berkeley in the tumultuous days of the 60s. And I was student vice president when Ronald Reagan was the governor of California. And I learned everything I needed to learn about negotiating from interfacing with him. The war in Vietnam was on, the demonstrations were constant. And so he and I sort of went at it. Um, but I was a grad student in an undergraduate uh, dormitory while I was in law school. And I was a dorm counselor. And one of the students there was a football quarterback, Steve Bartkowski. Wow. And in 1975, he was the very first pick in the first round of the draft, and he asked me to represent him. So I was just out of law school and choosing between different jobs. And uh, 
Bart asked me, he'd been selected by the Atlanta Falcons as the first pick in the first round. And it, we ended up getting the largest rookie contract in NFL history. Wow. And uh, so I had no aspirations to this as a career, but my dad had two core values. One was treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was to try to make a meaningful difference in the world by helping people who couldn't help themselves make a positive impact. And I saw the t incredible excitement that we flew into the airport with Bartkowski and there was a clean lights flashing in the sky the night before, like for a movie premiere and a huge crowd was pressed up against the police line. And I saw that it was the athletes who were the movie stars and celebrities in communities across the country. And I thought, well, if we would have them go back and retrace their roots back to the high school, collegiate, and professional communities that helped shape them, that they could establish charitable and community programs, a high school scholarship fund, a repayment to a university, uh, a charitable foundation at the, at the professional level, which had the leading business figures, political figures, and um, community leaders on the board, and then execute a program. And so I saw then the power of sports to trigger imitative behavior. This might be interesting to do. That's interesting. So it's very organic. Like you did, you with your first sports deal, you hadn't really studied anything about being a sports manager at the time. It just was something that happened organically, right? It did, and um, so again, that was that was a time, Alex, where if a team didn't want to deal with agents, they simply slammed the phone down and said, "We don't talk to agents." So there was not even the right to representation back then. And those few early years were sort of a struggle. Wow, that is, that's super interesting because now you think about it, it's like it's uh, it almost seems like it was like the wild wild west back then, right? Like in in the sports agent, was that the case? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. So one of the things that I find super interesting is that the movie Jerry Maguire is after your life. Um, at least that's what it says online. How how true is that? How true is that movie? And what was it like having a movie after you, after your life? Well, it's Cameron Crowe's original script, and it's uh, Cameron's film. Okay. But uh, he did call me up in 1993 and ask if I would be willing to allow him to shadow me uh, to pick up atmosphere and stories for a film that would regard a sports agent. Mm -hmm. So we then went through the next year and a half, and when I went to the 1993 NFL draft, he came with me and, and I told him stories, and he got to see and meet everyone there. We went to the league meetings where all the owners assemble, and I was showing off free agents, and he came with me. He went to pro scouting day at USC where the draftees were showing their wares. He went to the Super Bowl, a series of games, sat in my office, and I told him stories, lots and lots of stories. So I was technical advisor, and I had to vet the script to make sure that the willing suspension of disbelief that would hold you in a movie so you didn't get distracted because bad dialogue or scenes that don't look the way you know them to look mm -hmm. um, and then he assigned me some of the actors so I took Cuba Gooding Jr. with me down to the Super Bowl uh, in Arizona and I made him pretend he was a wide receiver all week and uh, so you had to pretend he was my client and I actually had to show the quarterback in the film Cush played by Jerry O'Connell mm -hmm. how to throw a spiral because he went to NYU and they didn't uh, have uh, football there <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of life up there on the screen, uh, but it's you know Cameron script. Got you. So so it actually isn't based uh, based off your life. Or it's on it's it's partially based on stories that I told them. So there's a lot of life up there, but there's a lot of his creativity too. So um, um, 
you know, I agreed with him not to talk about what we talked about and what went on the screen. For sure, for sure. No, no worries about that. But one of the things that I was I was curious about, you know, if if that was the case, um, was the when you were first starting out. You know, I think when you're first starting out in any venture, you have people who who doubt and they say and say that you're you know you're not going to make it. You're crazy. And I was wondering if that was if that was the case with you too. Like, did you ever go through a period when you were first starting out where people, you know, didn't necessarily believe in you or? Well, it had been strictly biographical. Um, there's not much of a movie to start with the first pick in the first round. Yeah. You don't get struggle. You don't get lift and everything. So, uh, but the truth is, after I had signed Bartkowski, I had to figure out the best way to do the business. Mm -hmm. And what, what I did figure out was how to profile players. I realized that I could talk to a great number of potential draftees and not share any values with them. So I realized that it would take a young man from a strong family who believed in uh, role modeling, cared about making a difference, was ambitious, wanted to be involved in second career. So I found out that if I talked to that person and his family who I profiled, I might have a very high chance of having them agree to work with me. But if I was outside that profile, one time a running back said to me, Lee, I'm my own charity, and he ran the fastest 40 yard dash out of the uh, office I'd ever seen. <laughs> How to find the niche that I could be successful in. Wow. So. So, what were some of the things you looked for? I mean, I know you mentioned a few of them there, but how did you how did you profile them? And did, did that always translate into success, or were there some kind of that didn't really work pan out? You look for first of all for the type of role model I wanted. You have to look for a big heart and look for someone who really understood the power that they could have of legacy and that they could make a meaningful difference in the world and, and actually tackle something in their own lives that always bothered them. Mm -hmm. Number two, you look for ambition. So someone that is going to want to be in second career. So someone who will want to go on like the tight end from San Francisco, Brent Jones, and have a multi-billion dollar hedge fund or be uh, a entrepreneur like Steve Young or, or be like Deron Terry who uh, runs the Anheuser-Busch distributorship in Kansas City and actually was one of three owners that um, we were able to produce. Uh, he and uh, Ray Childress and, and work done with the, with the Falcons. So that would have that ambition to really have a second career that would be like that. Then the next quality is work habits. So you can have players with terrific talent, but they never really make it in a big way in professional sports because they don't have the work ethic. They don't look at film. They don't study a playbook. They don't spend time away from that. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you look for um, courage under pressure. So really the key in sports is when you hit adversity, the game's getting out of hand. Uh, you've made a series of mistakes. What do you do then? Do you have the ability to compartmentalize, adopt a quiet mind, and tune out the stress to elevate a level of play that can take a team to and through victory? So you look for all that and read interviews the player has done, talk to the coaches, talk to other people who know him, and that gives you a better sense of whether or not this is someone who A, we're going to click with, and B, is going to end up being uh, a major success in sport. Wow. So you guys, so you look for one of you look in life, yeah, 100%. So you guys look for, for them to have the ambition for things afterward. Do you guys kind of help in that transition? Like I know you mentioned, you know, someone who uh, runs you know, a billion dollar hedge fund or they go and become entrepreneurs. Is that something that you help develop with them as, they, as their athletes? Well, you do because one of the things that we emphasize is that the enemy for athletes is self-absorption. You know, enough about me. Can we talk about how you feel about me? <laughs> That's yeah. self-absorption. Yeah. So, 
the key is for an athlete to understand that every time they're out in public is an opportunity and between the charitable and community programs and relationships they make and then going to a banquet going to an event um it's the ability to focus on another person for five minutes understand the the gist of their story um asking them for a card and then creating a, a rolodex or creating a uh, a way to to keep in touch with all those people so it's it's networking i think the biggest skill in life for athletes for anyone is the skill of listening if you can create enough space and trust in another human being so you can really peel back the layers of the onion and understand their deepest fears and anxieties and their greatest hopes and dreams and understand what their values are, how they prioritize short-term economic gain, long-term economic security, family, spiritual considerations, geographical considerations, um, uh, profile, uh, uh, making a difference in the world, whatever their values are, if you can be in touch with that, mm -hmm. with another human being, you can gracefully navigate your way through life. Can you put yourself in another person's heart and mind and see the world the way they see it? Understand their perspective. Because if you can, you can problem solve, you can, in our business, recruit, negotiate, um, and mediate and figure out solutions to problems. Hmm. So what are, what are some of the ways that you, you know, are able to do that? Because it's, it's not an easy thing to do, right, to create trust trust with someone, and I'm sure you're one of the best at the world at it, right? You have to get these athletes to, tr to trust you with their, with their livelihood and careers. So, um, yeah. So yeah, everyone in life wants to be heard. They want to be known for what they believe to be you know their true inner self mm -hmm. so the question is especially men don't share so easily um which every woman listening to this will attest to <laughs> uh, will share their great emotional thoughts so easily so it really is a question of of asking the right probing questions and then um not being so anxious to talk all the time or so anxious to dominate a conversation so that you let things, you use the term organically, you let the uh, things come organically to the surface. And so um, that process may not be just sitting in a room talking. It might be um, going shopping together. It might be going to when someone gets a haircut. It might be just hanging out in some way. Yeah. But um, trying to move a relationship beyond uh, the tentative stage to find that deeper uh, deeper self because um, if I can fulfill a client in terms of the way they define their life goals not the way I would do it or the way the world would do it but each person is individual and they uh, are not generic so they all have their their unique uh, thought process and their unique concept of what it what is it will fulfill now, your job is to find that out. Interesting. Has there ever been a case where someone someone hasn't known that themselves and you have to help bring that out of them? Well, I think that we talked a few seconds ago about sitting someone down and trying to have to list their priorities. So like I said, if it's, a, if it's an athlete, it would be everything I talked about, short-term, long-term money, uh, spiritual uh, family, geographical location, profile, mm -hmm. endorsements, but then it would also be being on a winning team, being a starter, the quality of coaching, mm -hmm. the system that a team plays, the facilities they have, and it's getting a young person to sit down and do a true internal inventory of what it is that really is motivating them. 100%. That's wise words to live by. I feel like that, that will translate over into, um, into into business and other areas as well, right? Like, 
you're able to understand people's hopes and dreams and desires. You're able to, you know, inspire them. Sorry, there's a car alarm going off down there. Can you hear that? The car alarm? Yes. Oh, shoot. Okay, it's off now. Um, so how, how, how does that translate over, like, I'm sure the lessons you've learned in, in the business, like, with, with uh, you know, understanding the athletes, has it translated over into growing your business, like, doing the same thing for people in, internally within your company? So let's suppose, first of all, that you're negotiating a contract. Mm -hmm. um, the key is to produce a win-win scenario. It's to produce a situation where both parties walk away feeling that somehow their goals have been fulfilled. So simply thinking about what I need or a client needs is not enough. I have to research that negotiator. I have to understand every part of their business. I have to understand what the profitability is, what the revenue sources are, uh, what the expenses are, uh, what, and, and then to research that person I'm negotiating with and understand what the pressures are on that person and what fills the goal. So if it's a general manager, is he being judged by an owner? And does he have to bring back whatever the results are uh, to an owner who, who may judge him harshly? And what will make that, is there a way we can find a mutuality of interest so that, that I can come away with a positive result for a client? But that also works positively for a team. And so you research that person you're negotiating with to see what their uh, game plan has been before. When are they, are they an honest person? Can you set up that same paradigm of cooperation with them? And, um, and to understand that in a business like uh, sports, repetitive dealing with the same people uh, occurs all the time. Mm -hmm. So it won't just be this one negotiation. Um, I always say if you're, the person you're dealing with has his neck exposed and you have a temptation to step on it, you better realize that at some point your own neck will be exposed and you really not want that to happen. So it, it uh, at the same time that we're we're at odds in some ways, there's also a, a level of collegiality that's important. Interesting. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that 100%, and I think your wisdom is absolutely incredible. Like, you can definitely tell uh, you've been through the trials and tribulations in, in those areas because uh, just, just hearing that is, you know, it, it seems, on the front, it would seem like common sense, but it's really... There's so many different, it's like an onion, right? There's so many different, well, you've gone basically as deep as you can go. So, what do you want to say? Sorry. No, when you get into business, you have, one has to remember that if you're negotiating for someone, it's not about me as the negotiator. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about trying to produce a good result for the client. So having your ego or emotions involved in this situation where you're personally reacting to something that a negotiator says as if it's an insult or a slight or uh, a lack of respect, that has no place in it. Um, in some senses, you have to bleed out all emotion and be awarded. And, and whatever comes out of your mouth should come out of it tactically. Um, people have a real fear of silence. But if you've said everything you have to say, you don't need to fill in the silence, the awkwardness. I mean, if you've made the point you want to make, young men can grow old. Uh, summer can turn to fall, and not another thing needs to come out of your mouth. So when you're in a business situation, you're speaking tactically, and um, it, you have to be very careful to not be so uncomfortable with silence that every gap in communication uh, becomes something you need to fill. It's almost more powerful too if you're able to use those those pauses effectively, right? So, yes. 
So going back to Steinberg Sports, what was the early days like? Like, I, I, you had your first client. What was it like setting up that company? It must have been a pretty exciting time because it was, you know, the roadmap wasn't really wasn't really laid out, right? So it was me uh, sitting in my parents' living room in West Los Angeles, sitting in their card room, which was my office. Nice. And at uh, they didn't have cell phones then, uh, so you were on a dial tone. Now, some people still had uh, uh, party lines <laughs> where you had to share the phone line with another family. But the point is, I answered my own phone. I typed my own letters on the typewriter. I took them to Kinko's copies to get copied. Um, and uh, I basically ran the whole uh, show for six years. And if someone called you uh, and you were on the phone, you were busy. There was no call waiting or anything. It rang busy. And if you're on the road and you want to make phone calls, you better have a whole ton of game orders to drop into the payphone. Uh, a little later they came up with calling numbers, but it, it took a long time to make a long distance call. And uh, so it was a different world and environment, and sports was very different. Um, so when I started, each team as a chair of the national television contract got $2 million per team per season. Mm -hmm. And now they get two hundred and twenty million dollars, wow. and the two franchises that came in in nineteen seventy six were Tampa Bay and Seattle, and they had a purchase price of sixteen and a half million dollars. Uh, currently, the Dallas Cowboys are valued at five billion dollars. So everything was different, and and I realized that to represent players, we had to get away from labor versus management and I had to ally with owners to try to drive revenue and I used to say to them we're doing this wrong if we have contentious negotiations that play out publicly um, millionaires and billionaires we're just going to alienate fans we're just going to push them away they go to sport for a respite from the uh, from uh, the problems of real life. We don't want to force feed them, you know, endless contract tasks. And when we do collective bargaining agreements, we ought not to play that all out publicly too. Because again, it's like Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake. Um, most people don't make anywhere close to uh, what people do in professional sports. Let's keep that private. And let's focus on enhancing the revenue Let's see how we can blow out the television contract. And what happened is three basic networks turned to hundreds of networks. And so it meant there was big competition to have sports as content, as a loss leader to uh, help build a network's profile. So they weren't bidding on the ability to make money from the ads. They were bidding on the ability to grow the network. So Fox, which had jump in and when the negotiation started it just exponentially raised the uh, television platform and then it was about building new stadia with uh, with uh, luxury suites and and jumbo scoreboards and signage and naming rights and the development of fantasy football and the subtext we always understood of gambling and um, and memorabilia and merchandise. So really the question became, how could we blow out that industry? Because the point I would make to owners is, our real competition is not labor versus management. It's the competition with the NBA, with Walt Disney World, with uh, HBO, with every other way that people spend discretionary entertainment revenue and and what they're spending is and what they do for uh, entertainment so let's make sure that football is the hottest sport and uh, that it and it's grown into America's passion and I represented baseball players and basketball players and I wanted those sports to do the same thing so really the key was to look 
at oneself as a steward of the sport, not just simply a representative of athletes, because to help the athletes, you needed to create a larger pie. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned other sporting organizations in there. What did what did NFL is you know by by far the biggest in the U.S. What did the NFL do differently than the other sports that you think, or did they do anything differently, or was it just the, the sports more interesting? <laughs> The marriage of television and football uh, was very productive because they sort of grew up together. And as there were better camera angles and there were, were you know, superimposition of, uh, of a first down marker and, and all the ways in which television grew with football together. And so, um, uh, it's everything from uh, ESPN developing highlights that were put to music, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and all the different forms we've seen were novel. One of the advantages is it's one game a week. So you have a buildup going into the game and a buildup coming out of the game. And because there are only 17 regular season games, every game counts. Cool. So it became an event rather than simply another game and uh, the fact that there are only 10 home games meant that in most cities they could sell out a big stadium. The development of stadia that were specifically designed for football meant that the sight lines, the camera and excitement, they created the concept of, of a game experience, you know, which had uh, cheerleaders and kiss cameras and er- everything uh, uh, in the world. Um, it also met the pacing of America, which like put pops of action. And part of the reason that soccer's never made it is we like sports that have finite su- chance of success or failure on every play. And failing that, a lot of scoring. So basketball has a lot of scoring. Hockey doesn't, but it also has fighting. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but football has short bursts of, of action and the ability to go to the bathroom in between. And so it fits America's uh, taste at this uh, particular time. And then the marketing was so clever, the way in which they created memorabilia, jerseys, colors that people wanted to own and be part of, um, you know, the names of teams. That it, it, um, it matched up with uh, today. And other sports had been around longer as primary sports. And so football got the advantage of all those sorts of things. Interesting. I know you mentioned the marketing there. What do you, what did, what did the NFL do differently than other sports? Like, for example, you look at the MLB in the last decade; they've really been struggling on their ratings, and it's because, I think, in part because of the you know the licensing deal, they wanted to have more control, basically, of of the brand. And I think the NFL has done maybe a better job at uh, allowing more flexibility for these different independent uh, you know. Well, one teams. of the things they did is, first of all, they had the longest off season, so it builds anticipation and excitement. I mean. Aside from the playoffs and Super Bowl, you don't see a game from the end of December um, until August with the preseason. So there's a long period to miss football and all the rest of it. Then they created a whole series of off-season events so that um, the scouting combine became a big, heavily covered event. You wouldn't think two networks would you know, watch a testing thing, but they created the the combine itself. They created the announcement of franchise players and and uh, different different designations. Then they had free agency run through the off season, so that was something of real interest. The draft became a three or four day extravaganza, so they extended. A series of events in the off season, which led to more uh, interest, um, and then even the sk- the announcement of the schedule became a event that um, uh, that was televised. So they were able to keep the interest high by teasing the interest uh, through the rest of it. 
and then fantasy football grew up more quickly than the other fantasy sports. So you had different ways uh, to to enjoy it. It's always had the subtext of being a great sport to bet on, and and we'll soon see paramutual type betting at the stadium and arena themselves as the as the limitations come off of uh, gambling. So there are so many different ways. Um, they created really strong affinity groups so that having your identity as a Dallas Cowboy fan or a Green Bay Packer fan uh, gave a mutuality, you know, with, with other people. Um, and they also televised enough games so that people got a sense of of a lot of different teams, um, they they it was more than just a home game. I love how you say that it's connected with their identity because it's almost tapping into some sort of human need, right, to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And I think that they did the best job at it. I agree with everything that you explained there, which is interesting. How do you see it? How do you see it evolving? Like, I mean, obviously, there's other other maybe there's other sports coming around like soccer is is starting to grow some traction here in the U.S. and even like esports, for example, video games is is one of the fastest growing things. How do you see that competing with the time for like the NFL? And, and, uh, and other traditional sports in the U.S.? Well, right now, the NFL is so dominant that it not only is the most popular sport by three to one, it's the most popular television show because every week time during football season, five of the top ten shows are NFL games or pregame shows. And it outrates... Uh, American Idol and, and, and Blackish and, and uh, NCS and, and all of the other forms of entertainment. So it's got a real dominance. The challenge to football is the biggest existential threat, I think, is concussion. And it's the fact that every time an offensive lineman hits a defensive lineman at the inception of a play, it produces a low level sub concussive event. So an offensive lineman could walk out of football with 10,000 sub-concussive events, none of which have been diagnosed, none of which have um, is the player aware of, but the aggregate almost certainly does the same thing that getting knocked out three or more times does, which is to create an exponentially higher rate of Alzheimer's, ALS, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, depression, and dementia. And um, if 50% of the moms really understand this and tell their teenage boys you can play any sport or not tackle football, it won't kill football, it will just turn it into a gladiator game where only the people that have big economic need will end up playing uh, football. So that's a threat. The other threat is obviously you have so many alternative forms of energy Entertainment today and, and millennials that are used to watching what they want on demand. So that's something else. On the other hand, we continue to develop new apps, new ways to uh, experience. VR is coming. And uh, so there's going to be a new project with Patrick Mahomes where a viewer puts on the headset and you're now in Arrowhead Stadium, and you can see the defensive players running towards you because you're the quarterback, and based on what you do with the ball, um, it motivates the action. So um, if, you, if you throw well, you move your team down the field. If not, you're going to end up getting sacked. And so it's the realist, you've got VR, and then you're going to have augmented reality, and both of them will enhance sports, saying nothing in 3D. I was definitely one of the, the kids where my parents didn't let, want me to play uh, tackle football because of the reasons you described there. And, but that's because they were doctors. Or one was a physical therapist, one was a doctor. So right. I definitely definitely feel you there. But that's super cool about the, the 3D stuff and how you guys are evolving, right? And that, I think that's with any business entity, you have to evolve to survive. Well, part of our uh, practice is not simply the representation of athletes. It's It's... Could we make an impact on concussion? Could we help in the development of a, of a helmet that um, uses coil and compression to attenuate the energy field and dissipate the 
force coming into the helmet? Could we find a new, new nutraceutical or pharmaceutical? Could we develop a new app that brings you closer to sports? So it's constantly trying to be entrepreneurial and get involved with and have a vision as to what the future can lead to and how, how we can be part of that. Interesting. Um, so I, <laughs> I'd be curious, would you ever be willing to sign like an esports athlete? I'm sure I'm like, in, for example, in Minnesota, they now have esports teams and they, and they have stadiums where they, where the teams like go up there and play up on the big screen. And well, the question is, um, what the point of access there would be. Yeah. Would it be representing the individual athletes and branding them? Uh, I mean, we first saw this phenomenon with eSports where um, where you would see a, a skateboarder or you'd see a BMX driver, um, and all of a sudden they built identity. So that, or would, would it be a better move for us to own one of the teams? which a number of agencies have done. So, uh, but definitely, uh, what is the definition of sport? You know, it's competition, it's uh, uh, the use of your body in, in a way that uh, demonstrates speed or strength or dexterity. Um, so, you know, sport can be uh, uh, whatever you want it to be that's competitive. Interesting. I think that's super cool that you're very open-minded about it because I think some people, you know, maybe are, aren't so open to it. But it's a real, you know, it's a real thing. Like it's 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 growing at an incredible rate, and so I think to be open-minded is awesome. But, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's it, look, each new generation grows up in a slightly different way with slightly different technology, and so it's really important to. Be in touch. I've spoken on 85 campuses because I want to be in touch with what that next generation is thinking and doing and, and interested in. Interesting. So, um, going back to your career, I mean, you've had eight eight rec or sorry, you've had eight number one overall picks. I think 60 other first rounds. You've represented, you know, a couple hundred athletes. What has been some of the most exciting moments? With these athletes, because like, I'm sure when you see them succeed, it's a, you know you, you you've invested so much time into them, right? So it's I'm sure it's a pretty joyous experience. What is that like? Well, I had players in the Super Bowl. Having a quarterback who wins the Super Bowl is one of the transcendent moments. So when Troy Aikman won um, in uh, the Rose Bowl in 1993, that was very exciting. Can you take Steve us through that? Hmm? Can you take us through that that whole experience? What was that like with Troy Aikman? I like actually at the Super Bowl. Like, how were you so, feeling when that um, during that? So he told me that he was hyperventilating during the national anthem. So okay. being in that massive Rose Bowl, it, it took him a little while to get going. But they blew out <laughs> the Buffalo Bills. I think the score was fifty-two to three, um, or maybe it was ten because uh, somebody got stripped of the ball. But at any rate, it was a blowout. And we were in the limo going back after the game was over, and I say, Troy, do you realize what just happened? And he said, yes, we, we won the game. And I said, no, your life is, is inexorably changed forever. You went in and you were Troy Aikman, a good player, and now you're Troy Aikman in light. And then we got out of the, of the car to got to the the uh, hotel and he was totally mobbed it was hard making our way in there so it was that quick or Steve Young who had been in the shadow of Joe Montana um, and he had uh, taken his place but uh, in the mind's eye of uh, 49er fans Montana won every single game he ever was in he never threw an interception they won every single <laughs> Super Bowl so uh, he was competing against a much larger legend, and so he goes to the Super Bowl against the Chargers in Miami. There are he throws six touchdown passes, and I got down on the field, and he ran up to me and he said, "The monkey's off my back. The monkey's off my back." <laughs> um, and uh, 
having players. So this year we had Patrick Mahomes mm -hmm. win the Super Bowl, which was incredibly exciting. I mean, it was only his second uh, starting year. Um, it's also incredibly rewarding to have players go into the Hall of Fame. And we had our 11th go in this year, who was Edger and James, running back from mostly played for the Indianapolis Colts. So 11 of them, because that's the penultimate in, in experience for an athlete to be voted into that Hall of Fame. So when Warren Moon, uh, the quarterback of the Oilers and other teams, went in, he asked me to be his presenter. And we had basically sort of grown up together because he played for 23 years, six in Canada, and then when he came back to the NFL, he uh, had 12 teams bidding on him, and he ended up the highest uh, paid uh, football player in history. Um, and then he played uh, 16 in the NFL. So we had gone through all of this, and he was a constant role model. He set up the forever uh, uh, he, he set up the Crescent Moon Foundation, he uh, brought hundreds of kids to college, he set up a high school scholarship fund, a college scholarship fund. So being up there on stage in Canton and being able to introduce him for all his wonderful qualities was a tremendous rush <laughs> and uh, sitting in front of a, a pretty full uh, football stadium. So, um, and the an exciting day of the year if you represent players because from Pop Warner on these players have aspired to be a pro football player and they're surrounded by large numbers of uh, family members extended family members coaches pastors all sorts of people who've been critical in their life so I was back with uh, Tua Tango by Loa, uh, with, uh, um, with my partner Chris Cabot, and, and uh, we watched the tension ratchet up. And then they got to the fifth pick, and it was Miami, and they took a while to make their selection. So the tension just cranks and cranks. Draft time's not real time now. It's water torture time. Every second seems like a minute, every minute seems like an hour. So it keeps getting more and more tense, and then all of a sudden he gets drafted, the explosion of rapture and joy. So, and you see someone's life change in that millisecond. So I would say every draft year uh, is the same, whether it was for our newer firm, whether it was Paxton Lynch or, uh, or uh, Jerry Judy or, or Patrick Mahomes or Tua. So like you're some sort of it's not like I mean you're not obviously like blood family but you're you you create such a relationship with them that it seems like you're almost family like to go up on stage and introduce a Hall of Famer you know to be his speaker that's you have to have a very close relationship with them right? Well, you do because these are people at a young period in their lives they're going through maturation they're. They're, they, get, they go through scouting, you're with them and trying to help them make the best choices. So that bonds you. You go through, they get drafted, that bonds you. You negotiate a contract, that bonds you. And then you're at games and situations, and, and then you're there in critical circumstances. You know, it's easy to be someone's friend when everything is wonderful. What's tougher is can you be there at the uh, times that are more uncomfortable? Can you be there at the times where someone is really suffering and needs a friend? Um, you know, that's the true test of friendship. Beautiful, beautiful. So going on to the next generation, you started your own sports academy. What was that like and what was the inspiration behind starting your own sports academy? So I had spoken on all these campuses, and we would be inundated with a variety of different resumes, questions. People in large numbers would send in questions every day, and I realized there was a hunger to be involved in sports 
first of all, it just says a career. Mm-hmm. And that you could work for a team, a league, a conference, an athletic department, sports marketing, sports branding, uh, sports facilities, uh, agentry, media, writing, being on television, producing, um, PR. There was an endless amount of options. And so the question then was, how could we educate the next generation of skilled, ethical sports professionals and give them the opportunity to to get a jump start so one of the things that we did um, was an agent of 20 something times all across the country from new york washington chicago houston dallas um, uh, Minneapolis? the bay area los angeles um, and that agent academy teaches basic skills how to negotiate. So we have the young people get up and they engage in a mock negotiation. It's how to uh, it's, it's how to recruit a client. And they've had to recruit a number of our real athletes from Ronald Jones to Marvell Tell to Patrick Mahomes um, um, and their families. And then they set up a charitable foundation and then they do damage control. Um, and so we were challenged how to do that in a quarantine time and uh, our with the excellent idea which was to have a virtual agent academy and uh, yeah, uh, we had it uh, last month it was a huge hit and now our next event is may 30th or this saturday and it's a, a, a sports career conference so to sign up you just go to steinbergsports.com slash career conference and sign up and and you have panelists a panel on media and both print electronic uh, the internet a panel on branding and marketing a panel on that's how to work for a team a leaky conference and athletic department um it's it's also a panel on sports entrepreneurship and it's a panel on basically everything you could ever want to do with sports and then we have a mentoring hour where people can actually interact with the panelists we have some superb speakers we have one of the key executives of the atlanta uh, braves given the keynote and then but there'll be people because this was originally supposed to be live in Atlanta, so people from Atlanta in a variety of different uh, uh, capacities. Uh, but everyone you'd want to meet. So is that, I'm cu- I'd be curious to hear what the feedback has been. You know, would someone, I, I would imagine if I was an employer, I would much rather take someone that comes from your program, Steinberg Sports, versus coming out of a university who's, you know, maybe a university program who's studying uh, sports management there. Has that been the case? There are some outstanding and excellent um, sports marketing programs, law schools, business schools. The problem is most of them don't teach specific skills. They teach the principles. Mm -hmm. So the ability to go out if you wanted to be an agent and actually recruit a client or build a practice, no one's really explained that to you. And so one of the questions we ask the people that... um, or on the panels is how did you get started? You know, what was your plan? We emphasize how you can break into sports, being unique, making sure that your resume stands out, that you have the ability to attract someone to give you an internship or as um, a potential employee, and how to do that. So we're very specific in in teaching skills that will allow someone to have a jump start on their sports career. Interesting. So that's the biggest differenti- differentiator between you and, you know, a traditional, you know, sports program at a university. Right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so, oh, I, okay, so I was researching a little bit yesterday, and I saw that, you know, with Patrick Mahomes, you did this really unique thing, uh, creating his own cereal, cereal brand, Mahomes Crunch. What was that like behind, you know, the whole branding and marketing effort behind that? And how, how did that come about? Was that something that you guys helped helped in? So, 
when Ben Roethlisberger was in his first couple of years, we had worked with a, a company that did uh, Big Ben's beef jerky. And he also ended up having Big Ben's uh, sauce. So that same company came and asked if Patrick would be interested. And uh, so basically, a lot of the money went to his charitable foundation. And it's not available anymore because it all sold out. So they <laughs> produced uh, a ton of, of different things. But it was just another way to to promote his... his uh, 15 and the Mahomes Charitable Foundation, which has done some amazing things, and it's a pass-through, meaning that it funds other children's organizations that affect youth in a variety of ways. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. We're getting close to an hour mark here, uh, but I did want to leave with one final question, and that is, what is what is one piece of advice that you would give for the future generation? You know, maybe that's sports agents or just business in general. Um, it's to do an internal inventory of what it is that motivates you in life, and to make sure that you pursue your passion, that you do something in life that fulfills you and that you make a difference in the world in a positive way in your own time in your own vision but this world's a better place for you having lived here beautiful beautiful well ladies and gentlemen uh eight time first round draft pick 60 round 60 or 60 time or no sorry what was that eight first round picks 60 time first round draft picks uh lee steinberg Thank you so much, Lee, for your time and sharing all your wisdom. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much, Lee.